Welcome to today's episode of the Working Wisdom Podcast Series, brought to you by the C.T. Bauer College of Business at the University of Houston. We're having a conversation about work-life balance, how to navigate and overcome challenges within your career, and how to make business more accommodating to a diverse workforce. Hi, this is Emma Schaffer-Wegi. I teach MIS 3300 at the Bauer College of Business and I am in the Department of Decision and Information Sciences, and I'm sitting here with Jamie Boleyn. Hi. How are you? I'm doing great today. How are you doing? Pretty good. I think you're colder than I am. Yeah. <laughs> I'm freezing. I don't, it dropped below 60 degrees, and so I'm pretty sure I'm going to die. All right. So, Jamie, can you tell us what you do at Bauer and how you came to be where you are? Okay. Right now, I'm the Assistant Dean of Career Services at Bauer, and in that role, I help people get jobs, mostly. And I also teach a class for all of the incoming undergraduates at Bauer that's called Connecting Bauer to Business, which does just that. It takes all of the things that we're doing in the classroom and talks about how does it fit into the real world and tries to fill in some of the gaps on some of the soft, squishy stuff that doesn't fit into any specific course, but you still need to know it in order to survive. That's, that's, that's awesome, and it's a huge responsibility to take that on, to connect that education with that tangible outcome of having a job at the end of it. I kind of feel like I get to pick up where their parents left off in some ways because they've been prepared really well academically for college, and there's a lot of things about the work world that people assume everybody knows, but the truth is unless somebody tells you, you won't know, and you can step into a big old landmine just because you didn't know any better than not to. And so we try to take all of those little secret political interpersonal things that people know because they've been out there for a while and make them explicit and explain exactly how it works and give examples so that our students can be successful once they leave here. And, uh, yeah, that's a very important consideration, that not just to give the knowledge, but the interpersonal skills as well. Um, is that what motivated you to put all this into this lovely book, The Care and Feeding of Your Young Employee? Yes, absolutely. I also work with hundreds of employers, and we were hearing the same complaints and concerns over and over again from employers about young people, and they could label them with different names of generations, millennials, Gen Z, whatever, but it really was just young people. And what I found was they're not bad. They're not bad at all. Exactly. There's wonderful things about them, and they do operate a little differently from previous generations, but you know what? Each generation before them operated differently from the generation before them, and this is just kind of how it is to be young in the workplace. And so the care and feeding of your young employee was designed to do just that. How do you take care of your young employee so that they can survive and thrive while they're working for you? Because they can be very productive, very effective if you take care of them right. And, and yeah, and, and that also signals that we're very diverse with age, with backgrounds, with language, with experiences altogether. But I really like how you are kind of closing that disconnect or, or allowing for people to see the good in all generations, regardless of where they're coming from or uh, what their experiences may be. Um, what about the feeding part? <laughs> <laughs> they do like food. But, you know, who doesn't? And, and people have talked about that, too, that, oh, everything has to have free M&Ms. You know, SAS is the top consumer of M&Ms in the U.S., and it's because they provide really? free M&Ms for all of their employees. Um, but there's a lot of companies that are doing free food at work. and But there's really benefits for that beyond, oh, these young people are so entitled, you got to give them food all the time. There's a lot of health benefits to make sure that your employees are eating good food and not just kind of sh shoving down power bars and coffee, as i got to admit sometimes I do. <laughs> and as well... Older people like to eat at work, too. There's really benefits for everyone. So, yeah, there needs to be social time. They need to be able to feel like they're part of a community and that it's meaningful and they're connected to the people around them. And we label young people for wanting this, but what they found is once they introduce it, the older people like it, too. I think it's just meeting that expectation. But there's different types of care, and, and that social well-being is one aspect, but the physical well-being as well, that by putting in not necessarily the M&Ms, but the healthy snacks or whatever snacks shows that you acknowledge their needs beyond 
here's your computer, and I get to crunch those numbers. Mm -hmm. And if you're one of those people that says, look, I'm not going to mollycoddle everyone, you can take it from the other angle of, wow, look at the cost savings and your health benefits for your company because you've got healthier employees. That's awesome. Okay, so you talk about Blockbuster in here at the very front as the primary example of why it's important to change our approach and how we treat the competition or how we treat our employees. Can you, can you talk about a little bit about that? Well, the truth is the younger generations outnumber everybody else in the workplace right now. The millennials are currently the largest portion of the workforce and Gen Z coming behind them is even larger. They're the group that's in college right now and starting to graduate. And so if you ignore them, you ignore them at your own peril. And there are companies in the past, like Kodak and Blockbuster, who said, no, we've always been the leader and everyone's going to keep working with us. And they held on to this idea of we've always been number one. We're not going to change. The world will adapt to us. And now they're gone. I mean, on occasion, I actually was out with a group of young people snorkeling, and they sold the little $5 waterproof cameras that have the film inside the camera that you have to turn and I spent most of the boat ride teaching everybody how to work a camera because they'd never <laughs> seen one before. And then when it was over, I'm going, do not take the film out of the camera. <laughs> and they had no idea. What do you do with it now? Where do you bring it? And I said, well, I'm pretty sure you can still bring it to a drugstore or Walmart because I thought, you know, I don't see those signs even anymore. Yeah, and, and, and that's technology has changed so much, so they have a lot of advantage with the new stuff. But sometimes we need to reach out and reach across the island and – well, there shouldn't be an aisle to begin with, but but that's the perception that we're we're separate by age or by experience or by attitude or by wanting those snacks. But when I think about what happens in my class, I learn so much from them of how they look at things, how they approach and how they solve things, and that has informed how I teach. So what you do is, is instrumental in, in getting employers to rethink their approach or adjust their approach and appreciating the, the nuances of how uh, younger generations attack any kind of task. Well, the other thing is, people talk a lot about their interaction with their phones and their social media, and they do spend a lot of time with their mm -hmm. phones, and I would argue most adults do of any generation oh, yeah. at this yeah. point. But they've also been accused, and not always unfairly, of engaging with their phone or their device more than they engage with the person. And some of that is a different environment for communication growing up. And so, whereas when we were younger... I think I can speak for both of us. We probably both wrote letters to people a lot. Right. And you look forward to going to the mailbox to get yeah. mail from people. And now I had a group of folks that I asked them to write thank you notes, and I gave them the thank you cards, and they didn't know which side of the card do you write on. And it was funny for a second, but then I thought, well, if no one's ever told you, how would you know? We knew because we grew up with it. And I heard a group of older managers the other day saying they don't have common sense. I said, well, some things are only common sense because you were surrounded by it. If you right. weren't surrounded by it, you wouldn't know. And then when I asked them to address the envelope, I got the blank stare. They've never had to do that before. And they don't even get mail in the mailbox anymore, so they don't see a lot of addressed envelopes. And again, they're perfectly capable of doing it. Once I told them once, this is how you do it, they said, fine, they had it. But it's not useful to judge them for not knowing something that was common sense mm -hmm. for older generations. They also don't know what, you know, be kind, rewind means. Yeah, sometimes my Terminator jokes fall flat. <laughs> A lot of mine do. <laughs> <laughs> so you do that for the employer side. Um, you're doing that in the classroom as an educator. How do you see students changing through the semester? You know, it's funny, when they first come into the class, I ask them about their confidence level and their interviewing skills, for instance, their resumes, their ability to communicate their achievements. And their confidence is pretty high coming in, like, yeah, I got this. And then at the end of the semester, I ask them, did your interviewing improve? Did your resume improve? And it's always like 90-something percent are like, yes, it did, which gets back to you don't know what you don't know. And people say, oh, you know, they think they have all the answers. I would argue most young people of all generations go through that. I mean, that's just part of not knowing that you don't know something. 
but once they're informed, they're very successful. They just need someone to give them the tips on how to do it. I had a manager the other day complaining, and it, it was funny for those of us that grew up with a house phone and the whole family revolved around the one house phone, <laughs> typically, that everyone shared, and there were time limits and no call waiting, and long distance was expensive, and people would call, and it was your parents' phone, too, and you had to take messages, and they were complaining that they would come in, and someone would say, oh, someone called for you. Well, who was it? Oh, I don't know, some guy. <laughs> you didn't get a name? No. And in their mind is, well, just check the call log. Why do I need to write down a name? And the manager was so upset. I'm like, oh, well, you just need to tell them because this is not the world they grew up in. You need to say, if someone stops by or calls, just get their name for me. And they'll do it. They're fine. They just haven't had to do that before. Yeah, and that's an interesting kind of circle that we complain about a lack of awareness about things that were not expected of them. And so the expectation is there for ourselves we just need to adapt that they're, they don't not do it because they are they don't want to do it. They just, this is not how they were raised or how they were, were adapting to their technologies. And they're generally very responsive to feedback has been my experience. And they're very open to being given information when they just don't know something. And that's the ideal mindset for education and for being a new, new employees. So I think that's, they're there. I think the other thing, too, is we hear a lot about, oh, millennials, am I right? That kind of stuff. And truthfully, every generation got it. <laughs> oh, I yeah. mean, all of the baby boomers, I'm sure, saw the movie Bye Bye Birdie. And it had that great song, What's the Matter with Kids Today? You know, why can't they be like we were perfect in every way? That one? <laughs> well, that was about the baby boomers and what a mess they were and how the whole world was going to fall apart if the, bo- the boomers were in charge. And then when Gen X came along... The movie Slacker came out that was defining the fact that they had no work ethic and they were lazy and shiftless and pointless. And and because they didn't get the message loud enough then, they came out with Reality Bites, which was also about Gen X not having a work ethic and moving back home after college and what's wrong with these kids now. And so it really is just kind of the continuation of a theme that older people get frustrated with younger people because they're different. And the younger people learn and they're very successful But the best part of it is the group that is currently most frustrated with Gen Z, the group that's in college right now, is millennial managers. (laughs) They are fit to be tied by them. And it's kind of fun to watch. It's like being the grandparent, just watching your kids struggle with their own children. But it's just part of being young. I did not realize that there would be such a close generational war going on in a sense. Well, in some of it, too, millennials, when they were promoted into management, they weren't always given the tools that they needed to manage. That's true. They were used to operating in a very collegial, team-oriented, friendly kind of way, and the idea of saying, setting firm limits was not always something they'd spend a lot of time with. This is a generation that was encouraged to be creative and to develop new ideas, which has been wonderful for them as managers They really want everybody to get along, and they want everybody to be happy. And sometimes as a manager, you don't get that luxury. And they're not always given the skills and the tools necessary to take on that role. And so that's caused some of the problem because Gen Z is a very independent generation. And so they'll take that freedom and run with it. And the millennials are like, but I always ask my manager everything. Why don't they come to me and ask me? Why are they just (laughs) doing stuff? So it's fun to watch. (laughs) Uh, We'll be right back after a short break. Join the conversation. Bauer College's Working Families Initiative is bridging the gap between industry and academia to create a conversation on how organizations can make the workplace more family friendly. We're talking about flexibility, maternity and paternity leave, and career transitions. For more information about the Working Families Initiative at Bauer College, including upcoming events, visit bauer.uh.edu slash working families. Can you talk about what Rockwell does and how it how it's different from other career services? The Rockwell Career Center specifically serves students earning a major in business or a degree in business from the Bauer College of Business. And so the staff that we have knows our disciplines very well, knows our recruiters who hire those disciplines very well, and we're able to sit down with students at all levels to kind of figure out, okay, where'd you come from? What do you like? What's important to you? Here's some areas you may want to explore. Or if they decide this is the area I'm going to be majoring in, okay, let's talk about the different career paths available. 
here are the folks that are hiring in that area, here's what you need to do to be successful in the application process with this company, because we know them well enough to know how their interview processes work. So we're able to give very specific advice to students when we are able to sit down with them and get to know them. And we know not all students have time to come in, even though we'd love to meet everybody. So we also have a lot of resources online. Our website is very robust with resources, almost overwhelming sometimes. And then we also have Bauer Career Gateway, which can be accessed through the university's Access UH system. It's only for Bauer degree-seeking students, and it has jobs that are posted specifically for people earning a degree in business. And so it's a nice targeted way to find opportunities. And it's funny because we see a lot of students going out to Indeed, Monster, which are great sites, but there you're competing with hundreds of thousands of people from all over the place. And here you've got recruiters that say, I really want to hire somebody from Bauer. And so you're just competing with your classmates. It's much better odds. So it's pretty unique in a sense that, that we offer this to students or you offer this to students. How can faculty, how can I help in, in raising awareness of this aside from please go to this website? What strategies would you recommend for us that we want our students to be employed within or before they even graduate to have that offer? What can I do to, to help you? A lot of times faculty have the opportunity to get to know their students pretty well, and our office does serve all 6,000 plus students at Bauer, so we don't know everybody, but the faculty tend to have closer relationships, and as you realize students are stuck or struggling or in need of assistance, letting them know we're there for them. People are like, I don't know what I want to do. I don't understand why I'm taking this class. I don't know what's going to happen when I graduate. Send them our way. We can help them get answers to those questions and hopefully help them find a great job before they even graduate. Our goal is to have people in jobs before they leave here. We want the offer in hand as they go across the stage so they are stress-free and all they have to worry about is not tripping over their gown. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty big goal. <laughs> um, I stole an idea from your class. Good. And I started those alumni and industry panel, uh, panels to have people come in at class so that they have that extra incentive of going to you. Can you talk talk about how you put those panels together so that students can gain even greater insights into why it matters that they put up their phones for those <laughs> hours or an hour and 15 minutes? You know, those are fun. We partner with faculty on those to some degree because a lot of times professors will say, look, I know this one person that's in this really cool job and we want students to know this is a potential career path for them. And other times we'll be working with employers that will say, we just don't think students understand the opportunities that are available to them. And sometimes we'll meet people that are just neat people. And I'll say, gosh, you need to be on a panel because people just need to hear your story. The goal of the panels is to have a diverse population in terms of, for instance, for the accounting panel, one person from Big Four Audit, one person from Mid-Market Tax, one person from Advisory, one person from Government Accounting, to get a sense of the breadth available within each major for the types of jobs that you can go into. Because a lot of times students will have a picture in their head of this is what MIS means, this one little bitty thing, and we're trying to show, no, it can mean a whole bunch of different things, mm -hmm. and each of these things has upsides and downsides, but to hopefully help them make better choices. And the nice thing with that is if we choose well, and we, we try to get younger alumni for the most part, unless we just meet somebody awesome that needs to, needs to be on a panel, but it's an opportunity, too, after the panel for the students to just walk up and introduce themselves and say, hey, I'd, I'd love to get advice. I'd love to get your thoughts. Because these folks that we choose typically are the type that want to help and they care about students. And, and I like that. It's, it's so crucial to, yes, we have the website, yes, we have the counselors, but we have that one-on-one -on -one experience that can open up a student's eye. Yes, I want to do audit. Yes, I want to be an analyst. Um, yeah, so I, I love that that I could steal that from you to have that awesome model in place already. Well, I'm glad you did too because statistically about half of our students are first generation college and so it's not like they can go home and choose from a whole bunch of CPAs and CFAs and you know all these other A's. <laughs> they don't have people to draw from necessarily already at home to help advise them and give them insight into different career paths and so the more we can bring in warm friendly welcoming faces to say let me shepherd you through this the better because we want them to make good choices. And I tell the students all the time, 
there's nothing more sad than you taking a whole bunch of classes and getting to the end and you're smarter and you're deeper in debt, but you haven't really made any major changes to your life. We really want them to change their lives and have better lives. That's so awesome. <laughs> so inspiring. <laughs> um, how do you do all this? Just to throw that out there. Because <laughs> you, you run the career center, you teach the class, you have children, mm -hmm. you do sports, mm -hmm. you travel, Yes. you wrote a book, mm -hmm. you're talking to me. Yeah. <laughs> how do you find all the time? How do you balance all of this? Frankly, I, I don't know that I balance well. I don't believe in balance. I believe in integration. Okay. <laughs> it just You can't separate it all. There's too much going on. I will say you have to pick priorities and say, I'm just going to focus on this one or two things for now. So, for instance, when I was writing the book, I wasn't competing in triathlons. Okay. I was still staying healthy, but I wasn't competing. And when I was developing the course, I scaled back on a lot of my one-on-one -on -one in the career center. So you find trade-offs so that you focus on one thing at a time because you can't do it all at once. But the nice thing for our students is they're young, so they can come up with a list of all the dreams they have. And as long as they're realistic and they budget their time, you can kind of check them off one by one. And it's not so horrible then. You can't do it all at once. I've, you know took me a long time to finally finish that book because I kept having other things I had to do instead. <laughs> but it's done. Yes, it feels really good to be done. Motivating for your colleagues <laughs> and motivating for your students, definitely. So you mentioned sports. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how you prepare for an Ironman? and how that may be similar to how you prepare for <laughs> any major undertaking. You know, it is similar to how you prepare for any other major undertaking. Every major big bucket list goal I have, first I sit down with my family and say, I really want to do this. <laughs> this is what the impact on you is going to be. And it's funny because my husband, I don't think, was really paying attention when I said I want to do an Ironman <laughs> because I said, you know, honey, I need to ask you something, and it's big, and it's important to me, and I, I want to sit down and have a real discussion about this. And he was kind of bracing himself. I said, I really want to train for an Ironman just to do this, to see if I can do it while I'm still in the shape to do it. And he went, oh, I'm so relieved. I thought you wanted to run a marathon again. And I thought... <laughs> We're going to let that hang there for a while and not really talk it through. <laughs> how, many, how many marathons are in an Ironman? <laughs> just one, just one. But the funny thing was, um, and I sat down with the office and I said, I'm going to be doing this. I'll be taking a lot of extra vacation time and things like that for, tra for training. And it, it was about six months intensive of training where I really, I was 15 to 20 hours a week training on top of working full time. And I, you know, quality time with my kids turned into this is so horrible I'd do a long bike ride I'd come home I'd say who wants to go to a movie and we go to the movie theater I put a kid under each arm and I'd fall asleep in the movie theater to have my post my post ride nap and so I was not a great mom and at the end of six months my business manager in the office informed me I'd not been a very good manager for six months either and I was like I know I believe that I've not been as present as I should have been but I'm back now and you have my full attention and I will say when it was all over, my training partner said, I signed up for another one. Do you want to do another one? I said, not really. And then I told my husband, I was like, Doug thinks we should do another one. He went, I've never said this in our whole marriage, but no, do not, <laughs> please. I was like, okay. So, yeah, you just have to say with everyone, here's what's going to happen, and then be willing to stop when it's time to get your priorities shifted. That's a good lesson for anyone who's learning a new language or starting a new course or is in business analytics or something like that. Any other bucket list items that you can share or you want to share that are with another book? It's frankly what I'm struggling with right now because I've, I've had a pretty fun run of trying things and, and having a good experience. And so now I'm in full midlife crisis of now what? I've, I've done all the stuff I wanted to do. So I am actively seeking out my next big thing that I want to try, and I haven't quite decided. I've dabbled in a few things, but nothing's really excited me yet. Okay, so you're like the first-year student whose eyes are open and is trying to find a path. How do you go about that? How, 
So what I've been doing, same thing I tell my students to do, I've been talking to people. Every mm-hmm. time I meet someone that's interesting or has done something inter- interesting, I ask them a lot of questions about it to kind of virtually try things on for size. And then I've also gotten involved in different organizations where I'll go to a meeting or two just to say, does this feel right for me? Does mm-hmm. this seem like something I want to go deeper in? So right now I'm out there talking to people and exploring and trying new things just to see what feels right for the next big thing I want to try. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Working Wisdom podcast series from the C.T. Bauer College of Business, brought to you by the Working Families Initiative. The initiative aims to provide support and access for women in business school and the workforce and to generate research that organizations can use to implement policies and standards to benefit a diverse workforce. For more information about Bauer College and this podcast series, visit www.bauer.uh.edu slash podcast.